коллеги, я думаю, пришло время продолжить наше заседание. И первый доклад, который я хочу анонсировать, я думаю, может быть, имеет смысл закрыть дверь, потому что там все-таки шумно. Да, нам было понятнее. И первый доклад, который я хотел бы анонсировать, это доклад нашего коллеги из Германии, Ульриха Клейн-Хемпеля, from University of Schweinfurt, Germany. He is a researcher of religion in higher edu senior education. He is lector and pastor. And uh, his presentation is called Spreading an Arcane, a religion on the worldwide web, paradoxes of transmission of the contemporary mysteries, cult of Umbanda. Yeah, thank you very much for the attention, and I'm very happy to speak about this issue here, and it is a memorable, memorable event to myself, because my last presentation in Russia is some years ago, in Moscow, I had the great pleasure of being on the Russian soil again. Now, to speak about the effect of Amanda on and its relation to the internet. I have to give you a brief introduction to Umbanda, this Afro-Brazilian esoteric religion, which may be called the only esoteric religion proper, because it has some structural features which impact on the way the spread of internet, of Umbanda through the internet works. It has effects on Imbanda itself, and these effects are somewhat ambiguous. So let me speak about Umbanda by itself first. What is Umbanda? It is an Afro-Brazilian religion of esoteric and Bantu African shamanistic traits, which has come to exist by this name for about a hundred years. After its emergence in the esoteric sit settings of Cardassist circles in Rio de Janeiro, but whose essential structures are those of Bantu African shamanism superseded by the Yoruban Nigerian cultic structure and form of organization. Now, Umbanda has been variously called a sect. It is not a sect, and this is distinct. It is not a religious formation defined by any deviation from a normative core of another religion, but it is a full-fledged religion in its own right. It is syncretistic in character, and its syncretism arose through the relative tolerance of Roman Catholic Portuguese authorities. The factual religious situation of Brazil was one of Vivaria of double faith. And suffice it to say that this is a complex concept, and I remind of syncretism studies of Ulrich Berner to grasp the systematic dynamics involved in syncretism. Syncretism has its method, has its structure, and it is a complex concept, too complex to deal it, with it here. Now we follow in the text again. In the course of time, Umbanda has adopted appearances of Catholicism, some perceptions of saints and values of charity, but in essence, it has emerged as an esoterically inspired and received religion with strongly shamanistic features and the ritual core of position trans in its priestly aspects. Now its practices and doctrines have been transmitted orally. This is important too for our topic. In spite of the literature in print and on the World Wide Web, this is still upheld in principle and this has implications at which we will look at. Now what is Umbanda? Its professed membership comprises about half a million adherents of 200 million in Brazil, organized in some 10,000 ritual communities, Tejeros, each with a differentiated ecclesiastical structure, roles, rituals, and participants. Umbanda is exceedingly complex as to its rituals and set of spiritual and divine entities, as well as to the assumed correlations. And there has been a rich esoteric literature on the correspondences, we refer to, uh, to Favre's, Seven criteria of esotericism. This is a wide field in Umbanda too. 
between different correlations between different realms of reality, including rhythms, music, and it has an enormous volume of ritual hymns. I'm aware of about 500, but I know there are many more. Its influence, the influence of Umbanda, extends far into Brazilian society. About 15 to 20 percent of Brazilians participate in Umbanda, in Umbanda public rituals and festivals, in the customary double faith practiced in Brazil. It also has a lively presence in music and arts. And you see, I've refrained from images so far because I've, if I would have entered into images so far, I would need maybe two hours or more, and this would not be sufficient. So why speak about Umbanda? It is a contemporary mystery cult, comparable in many features and close to the mystery cults of antiquity, which, of which we have experiential testimony through Apuleius of Madaura, the Golden Ass. It has the command of arcane discipline, of silence about its secrets. As such as a mystery religion, it is based on the experience of divine powers, also called energies, and beings, also called entidages, entities. This aspect is an inheritance from Bantu African shamanism, which is being reinterpreted esoterically. It is also secretive, with an arcane discipline imposed on its initiates, who are supposed to encounter the higher beings, not by information, but by experiencing them when they begin to manifest themselves. This is an important order of sequence. Ideally, experience becomes, for, comes before knowledge, when somebody enters the path of becoming an initiate in Umbanda. They manifest them themselves, and we follow the text again, during trance. Ideally, information comes after experience, and as such, Umbanda is in principle not a faith-based religion. Now, there is a widespread tendency in science of religion to treat religions firstly as a belief systems, and secondly as man-made, essentially in the same way as secular belief systems or worldviews. Now, to be frank, the concept of man in man-made is too vague as to be of scientific value. It is a concept which lacks sense, which lacks precise meaning, because what we mean by man can mean conscious, subconscious, can mean systemic aspects of a field, it can mean different layers of concepts. To say it is man-made impli implicates a subject which does something with its hands. This is more or less an ideological statement. It's scientifically worthless. And the man is interesting because one can show this uselessness of the idea of man-made. Of course it's man-made. Inevitably, religions contain belief systems. In the same way, poems and novels can be analyzed through the belief systems. The reduction of religions to belief systems, however, is trivial, since the experiences of the transcendent in its various form are deliberately ignored. The professed disdain for the phenomena of religion, widespread in Germany, by the way, indicates a systematic and ideological exclusion of the prima materia of religion. Man is especially interesting in this regard, since it operates with different centers of consciousness, whatever they are, and of agency, some of who are claimed to be transcendental vis-a-vis -vis the conscious subject. We've heard about the introduction of the concept of the unconscious around 1900, and Freud was very much aware of the political nature in terms of politics of science to employ the concept of the unconscious as an acceptable term in terms of general science. And he still had a, had a hard time with it, and the next generation, Jung, already explored this concept of the unconscious to make it a transpersonal field. Now, in Umbanda, the experience of transcendent entities is at the core of religion. It can be described as a form of esoteric shamanism embedded in a religion. Much of the training of its specialists and of its mediums is devoted to perceiving, experiencing, and expressing transcendent entities. Of course, the forms in which they are imagined can be related to archetypes of Brazilian culture. In this way, Umbanda is also a very Brazilian cultural product. Their origin, however, is much older, arising structurally, essentially, from Bantu culture. Umbanda as a religion is certainly a product of cultural imaginatio, of Einbildungskraft, in the sense of, the German, of German idealism. However, if we look closely at this concept, we may have to remember that it has been conceptualized as expressive of an absolute ego. And this is where we move from Kant to Fichte, especially to late Fichte and to Schelling. We have the double layer of the empirical ego and the absolute ego. 
which has been conceptualized by Fichte as a divine mind beyond the individual and the collective empirical ego. It's we also relate to Schilling, who supposed that in nature and in the human mind, a transcendent absolute mind expresses itself and it is raised to consciousness through the encounter of a person with the exterior phenomena of nature and nature is a very wide concept in itself and I believe it is fruitful to look at the second generation of Einbildungskraft to make it to communicate science of religion and to find new structures where we can operate with the concept of an absolute mind without having to say it is this it, or it is that or it is that form of the double consciousness of empirical and absolute mind, I think, is fruitful. And we, it has been culturally fruitful, I may also recall Novalis, where it into, into poetry. So idealism's distinction between different forms of consciousness and within the concept of the ego are fruitful for the understanding of Umbanda, since at the core of its ritual practice and its training of initiates, it is aimed at transcending the empirical egos of the mediums and to make them translucent and permeable for the expression of the cultural well encoded spiritual entities, whatever these entities are. I'm not going to make any claims about what they are. But it can certainly be shown that they manifest themselves in very distinct ways. I would also want to make claim that this is the expression of a supreme divine mind. I'm a Lutheran pastor and I will be very careful on this point. But uh, there is certainly something very spiritual about it something transpersonal and possibly transhuman in whichever sense. Maybe we have to relate to systems theory or the like to approach this phenomenon that something which is culturally quite distinct Brazilian, yet transcendent, begins to appear. And we can pinpoint the points where these transcendent entities do begin, both experientially and observationally. We may also refer to Carl Gustav Jung or to newer, often very vague theories about transpersonal field of consciousness, which might also be recalled here. This is a wide field to see which kind of epistemics are useful to approach the phenomena, but certainly we do not discard the phenomena to, just to save the theory and to reduce Umbana to belief systems, which is trivial. Now, there are certain affinities of Umbanda and orthodoxy, which I'd like to pinpoint on this Russian earth. To emphasize this point, a comparison to orthodoxy can be made. The orthodox church is frequently criticized by Western churches for being too vague in its doctrinal definitions. However, esotericism, oh, sorry, orthodoxy insists on the apophaticism of experience of the divine. I'm a quote from the life of Moses of Gregory of Nyssa, Late Antiquity, chapter 162. What does it mean that Moses entered the darkness and then saw God in it? As the mind progresses and through an ever greater and more perfect diligence comes to apprehend reality, it sees more clearly what of the divine nature is uncontemplated. It's a paradox of increasing certitude and ever more need to find concepts which can bring to the point of encounter of divine. And orthodoxy has preserved this realm of the not fully defined and in a way it is quite modern because it opens up the horizon for science and we are not at the end of science because otherwise we could close the shop and declare humanity to have arrived at its end if we would have a closed worldview to operate with. It keeps the worldview open and this is very fruitful, it's highly scientific, the issue of apophaticism. This notion is of an experientially intense divine darkness is fruitful. It helps to move beyond those aspects of Umbanda which are culturally, psychologically, sociologically determined, which can be well analyzed. And it's a wide field, and some literature, literature has arisen on this. It's complex and interesting too, but you have to move beyond it. According to di accordingly direct observation, contemplation is necessary. In Umbanda ritual, one can observe quite clearly when the mode of consciousness and the locus of control shifts from the conscious individual person to the perceivable, perceivable transcendent entity in trance. The point of shift is clearly observable, as well as its forms of expression. It's not the way somebody dances, but you can see quite clearly if somebody just dances the way one should dance in trance to manifest this or that entity, or if this switch has occurred. It's also, one can also perceive it oneself. 
full approach at this point of the change. Cultural differences can also be observed, and this is a funny and interesting point. In my observation, the lapse into trance is mostly more dramatic and complete amongst Brazilians than amongst Swiss adherents. And this is confirmed by both Swiss and Brazilians by themselves. It's, it's quite striking. A factor of cultural conditioning which is not learned individually is effective here, apparently, apart from the personal disposition and mediumistic training. This phenomenon, phenomenon can be researched methodically through rating by different independent observers, and I believe the method of rating by independent observers is a method from psychology to grasp and to ascertain those phenomena which cannot be um, explained analytically. You circ circumscribe them, and by means of statistics you can arrive at certain degrees of certitude about the phenomena, also of experiencing them. And this gives a methodical approach to some phenomena which cannot be grasped otherwise. And the, the phenomena which occur in a field, and I believe the field, concept of field here should be explored. It's a field which is constituted, for instance, by ritual space in which the rite takes place, either in a consecrated temple or temple grounds or within the sites of nature related to specific deities. There is the musical field of specific hymns and rhythms relating to the occasion, the particular sequence of ritual having perceptible psychosomatic and spiritual effects. Different instruments raise different spirit experiences. It's quite striking. Also in terms of intercultural comparisons of certain rhythms, for instance. The field of ritual objects and proceedings, then the ritual community, then the transcendent beings manifesting the, themselves through their initiated mediums in particular. Then the time, the sequence, the sacramental means, etc. All, all of this introduces the observable and perceptible spiritual manifestation central to Mbanda. Now, to give or to recall an image of Mbanda, I would like to show you just a sequence of two minutes of a public ritual where you can see how the mediums are working towards this point of the switch and the cult leader tries to guide them and to see, okay, you have arrived at, maybe you have not, but we can feel and observe the, this approach. Well, there is no tone to it, I'm afraid. Well, we may have to do without. There is quite a bit of drumming, but it's not essential. It's a ritual to the Lady of the Sea, Imanja, conducted at a certain time. Oh, leave it, leave it the way it is. You can imagine. Now, you see, this is one of the mediums here. She's dancing herself in specific forms of movement relating to Imanja to arrive at that point of trance. Tobacco is a ritual means for ecstasy. It's also working to come to the point of you have certain hymns and trance, now she's close to the point. Okay, this is singing the appropriate hymns. Very traditional African gesture in close continuity to Bantu. He is an assistant of the leader. And here you see the esoteric symbols, the esoteric reception, the white esoteric reception of Umbanda into its own fold. And this will be just a little bit further on. She explained, explains the uh, reasons for the people to come. Here's the cult leader. She's also close to it. No, here, you see her? Should I give her a little nudge and ask her if it has happened already or not? If it does happen, a kind of trance emergence which is um, which leaves a consciousness on two layers. A person is still observant of what goes on with oneself, but if you enter it, you notice a different agency begins to take over, and you can observe yourself, and there are different states of deep or not or shallow trance, but all of a sudden you realize you are working on two levels. And this is what he was trying, the leader was trying to coax her to, to get to this point of 
where the second agency takes over. Right. To illustrate what is meant by transcendent entities in the practice of Ambanda, it's interesting to note that they do not only refer to individual states of consciousness beyond normal wakefulness of the mind, but they also refer to the interaction between participants in Ambanda ritual. It's not only a way of entering maybe one's own subconsciousness in a way, but it also operates between those who look for counsel and those who have uh, entered the state of being a medium. A regular divine liturgy begins with an invocation of the Supreme Divinity, Dios Oloros, Olorum, this is chanted, Olorum, Stanwaye, Stanwaye, Olorum. God is in the world, is entering the world of the present, and it's an invocation of the Supreme Deity, which is not invoked in any other way. And then it follows with the rite of incensing, the altar, the temple, and the participants, and then the individual deities are invoked through hymns and special forms of dance. And then the service moves on to the point where the mediums into trance are possessed by the remainder of spirits and people can come to them for personal counseling and healing, spiritual and physical, by diagnosis and prescription of curative means. And I believe a lot of unconsciousness of the unconscious begins to operate there. This is the stage of the shamanistic pra practice. In it, the spirits are believed to interact with the person and possibly a spiritual being of the consultant. Being an orthodox country here, in terms of orthodox literature, this is the point of the Cherubikim. Ije, Cherubimi, Taino, Brazuische, Ije, Vitriashe, Troitze, the Holy Trinity is invoked. And this is a very solemn moment of orthodox liturgy where the Holy Spirit is also by gestures, a veil is moved to represent the arrival of the Holy Spirit and actually an embodiment is set to take place. It's, it's structurally quite the same point. In that framework of a chiefly oral tradition and of ritual community under the guidance of the lead of the ritual community. Then how does the internet influence this field? Iman emerged in 1908 from cultural and social continuum of Bantu African communities, which organized themselves as spiritual communities in Brazil, tolerated by the Portuguese authorities. And it was received in 1908 into the white middle class, into Catholicism. And from there, it moved from a traditional Bantu shamanist religion into the esoteric field and has been redefined in, as an esoteric religion ever since, either with eliminating the African element or with reinforcing it. If one looks at literature of Umbanda, from the mid-20th century, one may find the most fantastic lineages created to, to Atlantis through Amerindians, through elevation of spirits and the tradition of codicism and possibly also of theosophy. This probably served to legitimize Umbanda in the middle and upper middle classes oriented to codicism of Brazil at the time when the national ideology of whitening and of the country was proposed. Likewise, spiritual superiority of the Roman over the Roman Catholic Church could thus be claimed through esotericism. The despised African cultural element was frequently wholly denied. This threatened the internal consistency of Umbanda and the proper understanding of its rights and practices. However, in the course of cultural redefinition of Brazil as a uniculture of three races, white, black, and Amerindian, the African core element was found renewed appraisal. In the white milieus of southern Brazil, where Umbanda was adopted by quite secularized people and is still being adopted there, this meant that Africa has become a screen for romantic projections. Due to Umbanda's form of organization in independent ritual communities, Umbanda can literally be reinvented by every community leader. And this is now where the internet becomes important. Theologically speaking, in terms of Umbanda, the mentor spirits of each Tahiru teach and inspire the leader and the mediums and validate the tradition or reveal new, insp new inspirations. This means every Umbanda can community could, in principle, redefine the whole doctrine and the whole experience to make it a matter of personal gnosis. In view of this principle, however, the relative uniformity of this quite compl complex religion is astonishing. However, it also phrased, but also phrased out at the margins. Now, but in the age of the internet, 
formally the ritual and doctrinal, doctrinal uniformity which had been safeguarded by culturally closed communities, African tribes for instance. After Umbana's immigration from these contexts, the internet has observably taken over these functions of safeguarding the tradition. It has supplanted some of the lost cultural community. Something of a community of learned adherents has established over the past 20 years or so when Ubanda became a massive presence in the internet. And these cultural, these learned adherents discuss Ubanda in many blogs, websites, and so on. This is a new structural element which counterbalances the strictly hierarchical organization of the Teherus with their, in principle, absolute doctrinal authority, of ritual and doctrine, Vapayo Maid Santu. It's maybe a feature of Protestantization of Umbanda which goes along with the creation of a public discourse on the internet. This has led to the creation of a rich literature and many instructional videos, sometimes produced by well organized heroes, and in many of them, essential topics of ritual, of mediumism, of theology, philosophy, and self interpretation are presented. Factually, in this way, a body of semi canonical literature has been created in the course of just two decades which surpasses the literary production of the 20th century. The oral tradition passed on through the lineages of initiation, which are important in Umbanda, has been augmented consider considerably. This is, it, the, a library of reference and also of critical judgment has arisen. This goes hand in hand with an academization of Umbanda. The foundation of the first academic institution of Umbanda theology co coincides with the creation of online courses for, of instruction in Umbanda, offered by authoritative and capable Tahiros. In this process, Umbanda is being re-traditionalized in a way by scholarly reference to African traditions and the retrieval. The inherent dynamism of Umbanda is also being enhanced. Esoteric concepts, elements of yoga, of Reiki, spiritism are discussed and also integrated. Umbanda is being reinvented and adapted to new cultural environments. The creation of encompassing superstructure. They enable the creation of central networks, of associations and common organizations. This is a structurally wholly new element whose long-term effects will have to be observed. So, dissociation of Umbanda knowledge from ritual experience. Ideally, all learning about Umbanda was bound to communal and ritual as well as mediumistic experience and observation. This link is potentially severed by the internet community. It may create a development of Umbanda towards a religious community divided primarily defined primarily, primarily through common beliefs, detached from initiatory learning and experience. This is a sensitive issue in the development and in the stonomism. It's the rigors of the step-by-step -step learning in the initiation of Umbanda are bypassed to some extent through the internet. The character of initiation changes if dissociated knowledge far precedes experience. The constitutive element of the common field is altered thereby. This impacts on the mediumistic mystic experience and authority. There is a shift from the psychosomatic perception by learning and experience to the cognitive. And this shift is not wholly positive. It has some maybe more negative effects to it. What you can observe is the same as happens in psychoanalysis when the patient begins the, uh, to tell the psychoanalyst that Freud meant something quite different. This is a well-known measure of defense of the patient by rationalization. And the same can also happen in Ubanda. If the initiate knows more than the Paimai, the Santa who tries to initiate it him, it's an immunization against experience. is meant to be an unsettling mediumistic experience which prof profoundly impacts on the learner. Now the status of the secret initiate rates also changes. It makes a difference if one undergoes an initiation full of surprises as an organic development, or if everything is supposedly known beforehand, then it's very difficult to experience the surprises in this very unsettling initiation ritual where you don't know if it's day or night anymore and where your senses are. You become a, it endangers that. The prefabrication of imagination may impact on the process of tra initiat initiatory transformation of growth and experience in subtle and possibly dramatic ways. Umbanda's conclusion, Umbanda is undergoing a significant transformation through its presence on the internet. It has emerged from its context in traditional rural and urban communities, often of marginal communities, when viewed from, its dominant, from the dominant middle class perspective. 
But this immigration, it has, but this immigration, it has lost its cultural context with which it, it was transmitted together with the anthropological, social, cosmological, and ritual web of practice and beliefs. At this point, Umbanda could be dying out, together with its milieus. However, the fascinating process can be observed that it's decided in non-modern discourses, beliefs and practices, are being transferred to esoterically inspired dominant milieus, that is white middle and upper middle class of southern Brazil where practically no colored people live. And they are studied and reinvented therein, together with the significant transformations by the inclusion of new elements of outside of African tradition. It remains to be seen if Umbanda loses itself or recovers itself. The latter appears to be more probable in view of the evidence on the internet. Possibly Umbanda, and this is an exciting perspective, is beginning to fill the vacant place of an esoteric religion. In some countries, especially in Latin America and possibly beyond, there are some indications of it in Switzerland, for small but esoterically minded milieus. And this is an issue for a another conference maybe too. Thank you very much for the attention. And here is literature if anybody is interested in the instructional videos and so on. Thank you for your attention.